So if you are bored, next Friday, we're going to take all these chassis, take all the correct versions of those boards. We're going to build 100 robots. We're going to have the most fun since beer bike. Welcome to the uh, next installment of Campus Conversations. I'm David Lebron, the president of Rice University, and I'm deep in the basement of Ryan Labs on the Rice campus, and I'm here with Dr. James McLurkin, who uh, says he works on robots, but James, maybe you can help me here. Uh, this doesn't look anything like C3PO. It, it looks, I, I know, they, they, look, they, look like, they look like overgrown hockey pucks. Um, so what makes something a robot? So, so my definition is, is pretty basic. Um, I, need, I need my robots to, to do three basic things. They need to sense the world, they need to compute about what they have sensed, and then, then they need to actuate. They need to do something in the world. Um, they need to affect some change either by um, uh, moving themselves in the world or moving the world. And, and we're working on both of those uh, down here in the multi-robot. So it's those three things that, as you think about, characterize something, being a robot. Sense, compute, act. Regardless of size, shape, function, those three things they need to do. So it can, that, that, that casts a broad net. You could argue that, that when I fly, I fly in a robot. You could argue that my car is becoming robotic. You could argue that my dishwasher at some level, as it looks at the dirt that comes off my dishes, is acting like a robot because it changes its washing cycle. Um, but in particular, the robots I care about are ones that are autonomous. Uh, robots that we give some goal to, or something that we want them to do. And it's their job to figure out how to do it. But you're not just interested in individual robots. That would right? be really boring. Right? So most of us think, you know, we want someone to come in and That's right. do the wash for us, clean the floors, um, drive our cars. Uh, why are swarms interesting? So in order to understand that, we have to reverse engineer my psychology. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that one. But I can tell you that for almost anything that you, you want to do, uh, um, I can come up with some solution where I can do it with lots of robots. So some tasks are, are easy. Um, tasks like exploration, search and rescue, surveillance, um, manipulation. If you have a warehouse full of, of, of books and DVDs, maybe you're Amazon and you want to get them to customers efficiently. Robots are ideal for this. Um, if you're trying to uh, look for survivors in earthquakes, robots are fantastic. You've got Maybe cockroach-sized robots about this big. Yeah, we, we, we live in Houston, so a cockroach. Those are, I've seen that movie. Those are scary things. No, no, no. These, 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 are, these are friendly cockroaches. So, so what they'll do is they'll scamper through the, the rubble, look for signs of life, and then they relay their instructions to a bunch of maybe rat-sized robots who are the brains of the operation. Um, they then will compute the rescue plan and get the person out. They relay their instructions to a bunch of, or maybe a half a dozen, uh, brontosaurus-sized robots who then do the reverse Jenga puzzle of getting the person out. So, so these sorts of tasks, and, and then finally, ideally, you know, the opposite of, of demolition, um, construction. So you can use lots of robots to build things, like, like the, the, um, the famous insect builders, termites and ants, who build these beautiful nests and, and bees with their honeycombs. So I, I notice when you talk about robots, you use a lot of analogies on size and other things to the, nat to the natural world. That's right. And I, I understand you have a, a, a certain preoccupation with ants. I do, I do. So ants, ants, ants are a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, but more importantly, from a scientific point of view, um, ants have been, ants, bees, and wasps, um, the, 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 those are my favorites, and termites too, have been doing these, these, these distributed algorithms, the, the way of in which they work together to solve problems for 120 million years. So uh, how, how are they useful in your work? So, so how does... Understanding ants help you with your well, work on robots, and then does understanding your robots help you understand ants? We hope so. So let me start by what they're not useful for. What biology is not useful for is to copy to put onto our, our robots. It's far too complicated, and their, their goals are to um, have more babies, usually. Um, so we're not trying to have more robot babies right now. Um, but what they do have to solve is problems of resource, resource location, resource allocation, um, uh, dynamic task uh, uh, um, uh, assignment, things like that, that we can um, draw inspiration from. And we know these things work because ant colonies can grow to be 20 million in size, huge ant colonies. That, by the way, is 200 pounds of ants. That's about what I weigh right now. 
That's a lot of ants. That's a lot of ants. That's a lot. Those, those are the uh, dry ants. You'll find them in Africa. You're not getting 200 million of these. No. Okay. So, but 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 we but we can't we can do hundreds of these. Um, in fact, we have um, in the, in the shop we've got parts for our next build of 100 robots. Um, so we'll have about 120 of these these current versions of robots. So that's enough to start to solve problems in different ways. So the ultimate goal, as you mentioned, would be to turn this back to biology. Would be able to go to my, bi bi my, my colleagues in, in uh, Cornell or Arizona State University and say, hey, we've got our robots running your, your, your paper, your, 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 your foraging algorithm that you described in your paper on nature. And um, we could not get it to work until we tried this. Um, you should go look for this particular center, this particular effect in your natural system. Or we can tell them it works fantastic. In fact, we could remove most of this stuff and we ended up with this. Um, you should see if this matches your, your data. So ideally, we'd be able to give back to them. Um, and you know, I, I, I've been wanting to do this now for, for <laughs> since before I finished my PhD. Um, and now I'm, I'm making PhDs as a professor. So maybe one of my students will have the pleasure of actually working with real life biologists and, and giving back a little bit. Are we going to see these robots do anything? Or ah, good question. So let's, let, let's go ahead and run some. So what, what, what we've got now is the standard uh, four or five um, standard behaviors. Um, so off we go. So what you've got, let, let's, let's get them turned on. Um, so there's a power button on the far back. Yep. Gives me a real sense of accomplishment. That's right. And uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to get them to follow each other in a line. And we don't want them to follow in any random line. We want them to do it in an organized line. So we're going to have them um, follow themselves in order. Um, so what's going to happen is each robot is going to look around itself and look for the robot that is immediately precedes it in the sorted list of robots. Um, so um, they're going to use a distributed algorithm to get themselves to follow in order. So already they've figured out who the leader is, robot 9. That's the robot with nobody less than it. We're going to turn 9 around a little bit so we don't lose them. 17 should fall in right after 9, and then 19 and then 27. So they use their infrared sensors to communicate, and they also use them to avoid things like my shoe. Um, and their communication is key. Um, the same way um, that communication is critically important in ants and bees, um, without communication they can't do anything. Um, if you go ahead and get your foot in front of that one, you can send it back this way. There we go. All right, I'm going to tell them now to flock. So now instead of all heading um, um, in after one leader, they're all now trying to face the same direction. Um, so they're averaging out their headings and all um, reaching a nice coordinated flock. I should be able to still get them to avoid me, and that's going to cause confusion the same way if I were a predator um, and a school of fish. Um, but once they get away from me, they'll settle down back into a nice happy flock again. So, so the fancy word for this kind of stuff is self-stabilizing, and this is critical. When you have large numbers of robots, they have to settle into what you want. You can't expect to command them all from a centralized location. You can't expect to have complete control. They need to do their, do, do, do their thing. So how did you get interested? What, when you were growing up, what was, was there a key moment where you said, <laughs> I um, want to do cool things. So, I want to so build robots. If you want to know the truth, let me get these to be a little more quiet. Um, my motivation, and I, I say this in my talks when I want to give lectures, is I just wanted to build better toys. Um, I started with cardboard boxes to make forts, and, and, and I had a little tank with a ping pong gun inside, which was just a box with the bottom cut out so I could push it around the house, and then I put a ping pong gun to shoot my mother with, because <laughs> that's what you do when you're eight. Um, and then from there, I went on to um, model trains and Lego uh, video games. Um, so when I was uh, growing up, video games were very much like the cell phone games are today, where they're very easy to make a nice, fun game. Um, and uh, radio control cars, the fancy, high-performance ones. So all those things together, you put all the technology together, and you end up with pretty much a robot, which is what I built when I was in high school. And it was so much fun that I kept on building more robots. And then people started noticing I was having fun. People asked me to... To, 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 to be in exhibits about invention and play, and I got to go meet C3, C3PO and R2D2, and it just kept on being more fun. So fun, inspiration, passion, curiosity. There we, there we go. Thank you so much. I'm here with James McLurkin, studying swarms of robots, maybe not gonna change your life tomorrow, not but tomorrow. in the future, 
I hope so. Aid us in lots of problems. That, that's the plan. Roll, roll, roll to your friends. Thank you so much.